welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram. Instagram.com slash Great Detectives. I do want to encourage you to check out our other podcast, and in particular, I'm mentioning Public Domain Video Theater. Twice a month, we bring you video episodes from the public domain, which can be either TV or movies. This year, we're bringing you episodes of the Dangerous Assignment television program, as well as the late 50s series U.S. Marshal. You can subscribe to this classic video companion piece over at videotheater.greatdetectives.net or also watch on our YouTube uh, channel at youtube.greatdetectives.net and you can see all of the other podcasts we do at greatdetectives.net. This is a special episode. It not only marks our 4,000th regular episode, but it also is the beginning of our second time through the Bob Bailey era on Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. And I guess on Valentine's Day, it's appropriate that uh, Bob Bailey had played George Valentine. And that gave him a lot of experience as the lead on a detective program. He'd spent around six or seven years... It's a bit unclear as to when he left Let George Do It as the star of a detective series. But if I were to speculate why he ended up getting the role over, to, say, Gerald Moore, it'd most likely be because Let George Do It wasn't really well known outside of the western United States. Let George Do It was broadcast over the Don Lee Mutual Network, and it's most California-based stations. The series and Bailey got a little bit more play in the mid-1950s when the New York-based radio syndicator Harry S. Goodman re-syndicated Let George Do It episodes in New York, which was not really something that happened. <laughs> But regardless, Bob Bailey was an unknown to most of the country. While Gerald Moore, who we heard in Friday's audition, had starred in multiple nationally broadcast old-time radio detective programs. At this point, CBS was trying to find some way to keep radio drama alive, and I think that the network execs were going for a fresh voice. The brilliance of casting Bailey is that CBS got a voice that was fresh to most of the nation, but also an experienced and talented radio veteran. Now, let's go ahead and take a listen to the first couple of episodes. These were aired Monday through Friday, and the original air dates on these, October the 3rd and October the 4th, 1955. And this is the McCormick Matter, parts 1 and 2. From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, this is Father Taggart. I'm calling you from Ossining. I'm one of the chaplains here at Sing Sing. Oh, yes, sir. What can I do for you, Father? Well, nothing for me, Mr. Dollar, but possibly for someone else. Michael Cairn, one of our inmates, asked me to contact you. Michael Cairn? Mm hmm You remember him? He wasn't sure you would. Old-time grifter and con man who got tied up with an insurance fraud a few years ago, blonde fella? Yes. Well, Michael wants to see you, Mr. Dollar. Could you possibly find the time to come up here? Oh, I don't know, Father. Is this something important? It is to Michael. Oh, well, uh, look, I'll be in New York sometime next month. Maybe I'll get a chance to stop off. Well, couldn't you possibly make it sooner? What's the rush? He's going to be there quite a while, isn't he? Not very long, I'm afraid. Michael is dying. All right, Father, you can expect me. <laughs> Welcome to Johnny Dollar. Beginning tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Allied Casualty and Insurance Company Limited, Markham Building, Hartford, Connecticut. Attention, Ed Barth, Controller's Office. This is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the McCormick matter. Though you didn't authorize the investigation, Ed, I'm sure that once the facts are out, you will honor the following. Expense account, item one, $7.95. Train fare and incidentals, Hartford to Ossining, New York. I was admitted inside the prison and greeted by Father Taggart. He's a tall, mild-looking man, a Jesuit, I believe. He had a pass all ready for me, and he led me straight to the prison infirmary. Just in here. Michael will certainly appreciate your coming, Mr. Dollar. I hope it satisfies whatever's on his mind. I can't imagine what it would be. You know it was my investigation and testimony that put him in here, Father. He told me all about that, and I'm sure it has nothing to do with why he wants to see you. See, his lungs started to go about two years ago, and there's just been no way to arrest the condition. Does he know how close he is? Oh, he is. And he's not afraid to die. Here we are, Mr. Dollar. Oh. What? Hardly the same man I remember, Father. He's had it bad lately. Lost a great deal of weight. Yeah. Asleep? Yes. Michael. Michael! Oh. Hi, Father. I brought someone to see you. What do you say? Hiya, Mike. Oh, <laughs> thanks for coming. Thanks, Johnny. Thank Father Taggart here. Uh, he's an all right guy, Johnny. He's just like you. I always said you were the best insurance cop. <coughs> here, here, what's all this? I'm kicking out, Johnny. Didn't you tell him, Father? He told me, Mike. <laughs> Guess I didn't live right. I'll be back in a little while. Thanks, Father. You take it easy, Mike. Mm. <laughs> A yeah, lousy place to die, prison. But I ain't got my choice, thanks to you. Well, it's just that you picked to do a couple of things that the law and some insurance companies didn't agree with, Mike. Uh, I don't hold none of that against you. The guy does what he does. I, I don't know how to tell you this. <coughs> Maybe I better get the doctor. You shouldn't be talking so much. No, no, wait. Johnny, look, you know I'm no crybaby. When the doctor gave me the news, I, I got to thinking... I ain't scared to blow out, you understand? I know, Mike, I know. You know. It's just that I had a wife once, a long time ago when I started out. Oh? Yeah. Then I just kind of drifted out of her picture one day. And... <coughs> ain't got a cough drop, baby. <laughs> yeah, I guess it wouldn't cure what I got. Anyhow, I, I got to do something for her before I... Well, Johnny, I lay here and I get myself an idea. Yeah, Mike? Johnny, if there was some real easy money lying around, would you pick it up for me? Depends on how clean it is, Mike, and where it's lying. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. It, it, well, it's clean, all right. You can find that out for yourself. All right. Now, now listen. Till they moved me down here in the infirmary, I roomed upstairs with Jojo Penny. You know him? No, don't believe I do. And Carthy from the Hay States. He got his sabbatical three weeks ago. Paroled. Uh-huh. Well, I've been in the camp with a lot of guys, but Jojo Penny <laughs> takes the cake. He's got a little old five-year trick to put in. <laughs> this Jojo, he does it like a vacation. You know, a real picnic. <laughs> Every time he gets a chance out in the yard, he's taking sun. So he don't get the color, see? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> when they push him in with me, I notice this. And I get to going over it in my head. Yeah. Why does a guy whistle in a cell block, Johnny? Why, why is he treating it like a rest home? Short term. He's got something outside waiting. <sighs> That's it, baby. He's got something waiting for him outside. Something that he knows will keep safe. Money. Thought you said this was legitimate, Mike. <sighs> it is, it is. Now, wait. I, I didn't ask Jojo anything about this. No, I figured it out myself. Then a couple of times I hear him yelling in his sleep. McCormick, he yells. McCormick. Huh? Make sense now, Johnny? Not yet. Yeah. The big heist, Johnny, the big heist. A few years ago, a rich guy named McCormick out on Long Island or someplace like that gets turned over for $100,000 worth of jewelry. You remember? Vaguely. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking that Jojo Penny was in on it somewhere. Mm. Else why would he be singing and whistling and chilling himself around this fly trap for five years? Else why would he be talking about that when he's sleeping? McCormick. McCormick. Yeah. 
Maybe you've got something, Mike. Ah, I know I got something, Johnny. And you got something, too. It... <laughs> oh, no, Mike. Take it easy. Oh, I'm all right. I'm all right. Don't you see? The insurance company must have a reward out. They always do. A reward. Yeah, but Mike, look. I tell you, Joe Joe is the Ginzo that done the job. Or he knows who did it. So, you look into it. Work on it. Maybe turn up the stuff and get the reward. Good clean coin. Yeah. Yeah. Send half of it to my old lady, will you? You keep the rest yourself. What'd you say? Huh? Will you? Mike Cairn died three hours later. The last living thing he did was wink at me. Expense account item two, $14.20. Train fare and incidentals, Ossining to New York. I arrived at 2.15, dropped my bag off at the New Western, and went over to the Metropolitan Police Station to find out what I could about the McCormick matter. It was all pretty much as old Mike had told me. A Julian McCormick living on Long Island had suffered a $100,000 jewelry burglary in 1951. Twelve suspects had been arrested and released. The case was marked open and unsolved. Allied Casualty had been the insurance company involved. This is the adjustment office. Frank Porter speaking. My name's Johnny Dollar, Mr. Porter. I'm an investigator. Oh, I think I've heard of you, Mr. Dollar. Yeah? Wonder if you could give me a little information about a claim your company handled in 1951. A man named Julian McCormick out on Long Island. Gee, well, long time ago. Uh, what about the McCormick claim? I might have some information on it. I don't know yet. It's a long chance. I'm at police headquarters, and I notice you investigated for the insurance company. I'd like to talk to you. Yeah, sure, but it's kind of late today. Tomorrow, okay? Well, you can tell me this right now. Is there any reward being offered? Gee whiz, kind of folds my sails. How's that? Well, asking about a reward. You sound like you can make full recovery and want to make sure that you'll be paid for it. Well, I said it was just a long shot. How about the reward? Well, that's pretty standard with us on cases like this. Yeah, I think it's 7500 something like that. I'm not sure. Where are you staying? New Weston. Well, I'll look it up, get the exact figure, and call you there. How'll that be? Fine, thanks. That'll be fine. Before I left the police station, I turned out a mug on Jojo Panny. He was a big, broad-shouldered lad with plenty of beef and a list of petty convictions, four of them in New York State. The last one was for carrying concealed weapons. His parole status was good, though, and the parole officer furnished me with his home address. The Allen Hotel, rates day, week, a month, 115th Street. It's open, it's open. Come on in. Hiya. Looking for Joe Penn. Yes, sir. That's me. My name's Johnny Dollar. Yeah? I, uh, I just came down from Ossining. I saw a friend of yours up there, Joe. Who was that? Mike Cairn. How's Mike? Not so good. He died today. Uh, it's too bad. He was a nice old coot. Kind of liked him. Said if I ever saw you to say hello. Uh-huh. He didn't give you my address. No, I got it from the parole office. You some kind of cop? No, I work for an insurance company. Oh. Buy you a drink? Sure. Why not? Expense account item three, four dollars even for drinks. I wanted to look at Joe Joe Panny and talk to him and figure out how I was going to go about getting information from him. And the more I saw and the more he talked, the more I wondered if whatever he might have said about the McCormick case in his sleep happened to some other McCormick. After all, a man with a long list of petty thieveries is hardly ever involved in a slick, big time safe cracking job. That takes another kind of talent, and one I was sure that Joe Joe didn't have. So I just been taking it easy and looking around. I figure I can get a job pushing a truck or maybe a cab if I'm lucky. Got to get something to do. Parole officers kind of hard nosed about things like that. Yeah. Drink up. Want one more? No, oh, no, no thanks. Three's my limit. Like to keep in shape. Sure. Say, uh, you got anything to do? Nothing special. Why? 
Thought I might go out to Long Island later on tonight to say hello to an old friend of mine. If you haven't got anything to do, come on along. <laughs> You're okay, bub. Sure, why not? Uh, this friend of yours, he's an ex-con too? No, he never did any time. Just a friend. Want to say hello is all. Oh. Rich fella. His name's Julian McCormick. You're, uh, very big with the hellos around here today, aren't you? Anything wrong, Joe? You probably are. Why do you say that? Nothing. Ever know anyone named McCormick? I knew a guy named Arnie McCormick once back in Salt Lake City. We were pals for a while. Oh. Yeah. Arnie was killed in the war. He'd got himself drafted in the infantry. Maybe he's related to my friend Julian McCormick out on Long Island. He wasn't related to anybody, not that bird. I'm leaving. I want to get up early tomorrow. Why not come with me? <laughs> Thanks for the drinks. He drifted off down the street and left me standing there. And one thing I was sure of, he had the name McCormick on his mind. Whether it was the right McCormick or the right case, I didn't know. Anyhow, he was my one big lead. So I was back at his hotel early the next morning and talking to the desk clerk. Penny, did you say room 210? Yeah, that's right. Vamoose. What? He left bag and baggage last night. Well, where did he go? What's his forwarding address? He didn't say. Just left. Johnny Dollar. It's Frank Porter, Allied Casualty. Yes, Mr. Porter. Well, call me Frank, Johnny. Uh, you phoned yesterday about the McCormick matter. I got all the stuff about the case on my desk here. Uh, we're still offering $7,500 reward. Thanks for confirming it, Frank. Sure. Uh, you got a tip or something? An old con named Mike Cairn gave me a tip about a guy named Jojo Panny. I'm working on it. Well, need any help? No, not yet. I might. Jojo pulled out of his hotel last night, bag and baggage. Oh, what are you going to do? I'm on my way to Long Island. Huh? I want to talk to McCormick himself. Oh. Uh, Johnny. Yeah? Let me give you a tip for your own good. Don't bother Julian McCormick unless you've really got something. Could be dangerous. I think I've got something. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Allied Casualty and Insurance Company Limited, Markham Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the McCormick matter. Item four, $10 deposit on the car I rented to drive out to Julian McCormick's home on Long Island. And judging by the looks of the place, a safe full of $100,000 worth of jewelry would feel right at home. It was a mansion, and the rugs on the floor were an inch thick. I'm sorry I've kept you waiting. Mrs. McCormick and I were packing for a little trip to Europe. Sit down, please. Thanks. Going to be gone long? Oh, we usually spend several months a year over there. We're a bit late this year. Our reservations are for next week. I envy you, Mr. McCormick. Dollar, the name? That's right. Forgive me, but I don't seem to recall having heard of you before. Oh, that's okay. We never met. I'm an insurance investigator. Oh, really? Am I being investigated or something? No, no, nothing like that. It's just that I might have a lead on that jewelry that was taken from your home a few years ago. Well, that's wonderful. You must tell me about it. Can I make you a drink? No, thanks. You're from the insurance company, Allied Casualty? No, no, I'm not. I'm an independent investigator. Well, why should anyone feel it necessary to call in a... Oh, oh, I see. There's a reward, of course. That's right. Yes, of course. But now, tell me, how can I help you? Well, I'm just checking a few things, Mr. McCormick. I haven't even gone over it with a man who handled the case for Allied... Possibly I have run into something that'll help. I don't know. I'd like you to tell me what happened. My safe was opened and my jewelry taken. I mean, how it happened. Well, it was right in this very room. 
That's the wall safe there. Uh Uh-huh. Mrs. McCormick and I had just returned from our honeymoon. Five years ago, it was. Yeah? All I know is that when I stepped into the library here that morning, the safe was open and everything was gone. Whoever did it was extremely clever and quiet, I must say. Was the safe cracked? No, no, no. It was just opened. Someone figured the combination or something like that. Well, who knew the combination at the time? Only myself, Mr. Dollar. You're sure of that? Why, of course. I see. I reported it to the police right away here on Long Island. Then some men from New York City were here, too. And your insurance company? I reported it to my insurance company immediately. They had a man on the scene as soon as the police. A uh, Mr. Porter. Frank Porter? Yes. Do you know him? I've talked to him on the phone. I haven't met him. A very nice chap. He worked very hard trying to recover it. I'm sure he did. Did they have an adjuster? Yes. Uh, How much did you collect, if you don't mind? Not much. What do you mean? Well, it was unfortunate. By keeping that much jewelry in a small house safe, it seems I violated the clause in the contract. It should have been kept in a safety deposit box or some such. Consequently, the matter went into litigation. I'm afraid the court found me at fault. I collected only a part of the insured value, $20,000. So, you can see, I'd certainly welcome a recovery. Sure. The jewelry was in the family a good many years. I had given it to my wife, and I... Well, a man hates to lose things he loves. Yes, I understand. Was Mrs. McCormick here the morning it happened? Oh, yeah? I'd like to talk to her. She's terribly busy, but if you think it's sufficiently important, I'll call her. No, never mind. I'm curious, Mr. Dollar. This case has been closed a long time. At least, no one's contacted me or asked me for any information about it for at least four years. What opened it? A man named Mike Cairn. Huh? Who's he? An old convict up at Ossining who shared a cell for a while with a man named Joe Panny. Uh-huh. Cairn died yesterday. But before he died, he told me he thought Panny had something to do with it. He'd heard him mention your name. Well, it seems to me you should talk with this Joe Panny. I did. And I will some more. As soon as I locate him again. Right now he's missing. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, thanks for the time, Mr. McCormick. You let me know if you learn anything? Sure. Do you honestly think you can recover that jewelry? With any luck at all? That would be wonderful, wonderful. You think so? Why, yes, of course. Mrs. McCormick might be glad to know about it, too. What? You said it was her jewelry. I don't know why I said that to him. Just a sudden impulse. But he wasn't smiling when he walked me to the door, shook my hand, and patted me on the shoulder. I had a funny feeling that Mr. Julian McCormick was scared like a rabbit of me. I drove back to the city, had lunch at Walgreens, and dropped into Allied Casualties, New York office, to pick up the folder on reward information. I met Frank Porter and liked him right away, a big red-headed man in a tweed suit. Well, gee whiz, Johnny, it makes me feel older than ever doing this. How come? Well, I weighed 15 pounds less when this case started, June 1951. Ah, here we are. Uh, these are pictures of the stuff. Uh-huh. Now, that one they call Tierra del Fuego. Huh? Some necklace, hmm? I can see why. Yeah, and uh, this one was called Imperial, in the royal family of Russia at one time. And uh, this is the other one, Placid. And beautiful stuff. Oh, you can say that again. That all of it? Well, that's about the size of it, Johnny. $100,000 gone. Yeah. Help any? Sure. It's nice to know what I'm trying to find. Well, I hope you have better luck than I did. Yeah. Say, uh, who was the police officer on the case? Uh, Martin. Duels Martin. Out of Central? Yeah. We ran down every lead we could find, big and small. The file said you made 12 arrests. Yeah, something like that, but not one of them panned out. Had to let them all go. Martin requested pickups on every big-time jewelry man in the country. Now, I don't think one of them was overlooked. Well... No, Johnny, somebody just simply walked in that house, opened the safe as neat as you please, and walked right out with all of this. Very slick job. Had to be an experienced man. Well, might have been a first job for someone just starting in. He got lucky. Yeah, we thought of that, and we didn't think much of it after a while. Frank, you... Gee whiz, Johnny, you know, nobody could be that lucky. Chase the house, know exactly where the safe was, know what was in it, get in, open it up, and get out without anybody, servants, the McCormicks, or any of their friends even seeing. Mm-hmm, yeah. Well, that wasn't even the hardest part, you see. Not one scrap of this stuff has ever turned up anywhere. Yeah, well... Anywhere. Now, what did, what did whoever took it do with it? Did he break it down, sell it overseas? What? Not a trace of it. Imagine that. Imagine. You know what I think? 
I think the guy who swiped all this stuff still has it. I think he's sitting around waiting for it to cool off. Could be. Uh... But it's never going to cool off, Johnny. There isn't a city in this country or across the ocean that isn't on the lookout for these pieces. I suppose. Now, sooner or later, hot boy or lucky boy, well, whoever he is, will make a move. <laughs> Meantime, we just wait. Unless, of course, uh, you've got something for us to look into. Uh, not yet, Frank. Yeah, well, when you have, we'll be right with you all the way. Good, good. How about a drink? Uh, take a rain check. Okay. But remember, we got a whole floor full of lawyers upstairs. They can get up warrants, writs, seizure orders, anything you might want. Yeah. You just let me know when you get somewhere and we'll go to work. I'll do that, Frank. I left Frank Porter and went back over to the parole office to see what had developed with Joe Panny. After all, if he didn't report in, he'd be in violation of his parole, be in real trouble. But nothing had developed. He hadn't put in a change of address, nothing. So I went back to my hotel and had some dinner. Then I shaved, changed my clothes. Expense account, item five, dollar and a half, cab fare. I garaged my rented car, went back to Central Police Station and pulled out the mug on Joe Panny once more, hoping to get a line on some friends or relatives of his where he might be staying. Up till then, things had been going pretty routine. Then a clerk from the parole offices stepped across the hall. Hi, Mr. Dollar. Hi. Thought it was you I saw in here. I wasn't sure. How's it going? Fine, fine. Talk to your friend Jojo Panny yet? Not today. Why? Well, you seemed awful anxious to talk to him, is all. I am. Why don't you go see him? You playing games? I've been trying to find out where he is all day. And I already told you. You what? Sure, I gave it to you half an hour ago when you phoned. When who phoned? Sure, about half an hour ago. Look, Joe Panny called in and told me his address. Yeah? I no sooner set down a phone and you call in and said, this is Johnny Dollar. Have you heard from Joe Panny? Why? I said, yeah, and I told you his address, that's all. What address did you say? The Allen Hotel on 115th Street. Same place he was before. What's the matter, you forget? It took me ten minutes to get from the police station over to the Allen Hotel. Ten minutes of wondering who'd put in that call and use my name. I went up the stairs, two at a time, up to the second floor. And right at the top of the landing, I bumped into a dark-haired woman wearing a silver fur piece. Oh! Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't see you. It's all right. You hurt? No, not at all. Please, let me go past. I'm in a hurry. Yeah, I'd be in a hurry, too. What do you mean? The gun. What? You should carry it on the inside of your purse. Oh, I didn't... Suppose I take let it. Go! Let go of me! You... Fingernails, sir. Huh? Give it to me. All right, take it! She'd given it to me, all right, right on the side of the head. It didn't knock me out, but it did knock me off balance, so I tangled up with a hall table. And that gave her plenty of time to scurry down the stairs while I got out of the furniture and back on my feet. By the time I got down the stairs and out on the street, she was nowhere in sight. Hmm. No one yelled, I'm shot. No one did anything but what they were already doing. Where were you just now? You weren't here at the front desk. I was out back eating my dinner. Why? Oh, nothing. You happen to see that woman who just ran through here? No. Tall, dark-haired woman, about 30, wore a mixed stole? Me? Yeah. Oh, you're kidding. In this joint. Oh, brother. You still looking for Joe Panny? He lives here again, doesn't he? Yeah. Have you seen him? Where is he? Out. I sat down with myself and waited a half an hour later, when the clerk went back to finish his dinner, I stepped over to the desk and borrowed his pass key and went back up the stairs to room 210. Well, I didn't need the pass key and I didn't need to doubt the clerk. Joe Panny wasn't there. But all of his things were. The curtains were drawn and the windows closed. Every drawer had been pulled out of every dresser. The mattress on the bed was slipped from top to bottom, and the rug had been ripped and turned over. <laughs> Expense account, item six, one dollar, one drink. For me. I left JoJo's room, went to the nearest bar, sat down, and had a drink. A scared victim, a missing con... A dark-haired woman wearing a mink and a gun, and other things. Right then and there, I decided that Mike Cann's tip had been pretty good at that.
Now, here's our star, Bob Bailey, to tell you about tomorrow's episode. Thanks. Tomorrow, a slight case of mayhem. When the right guy turns up in the wrong place. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, the entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Welcome back. Well, overall, a solid setup. Some good acting, some great questions raised, and were presented with some intriguing mysteries. Now, as a serial, each episode ends on a bit of a cliffhanger, and those can be a bit challenging. I didn't think much of part twos, with Johnny going, getting a drink, and saying, wow, this has been a case with a lot of weird stuff happening. But other than that, these first couple episodes are really solid. Well, we turn now to listener comments and feedback, and we have a couple of comments regarding the Sarah Martin matter. Stephen writes, I have a plot question. Why did the victim tell the home office his wife was going to kill him when he had just discovered his secretary and his ex-employee had been embezzling? It was great misdirection, but seems unrealistic. Well, I actually think it makes sense. Because if your domestic situation has deteriorated to the point where you're afraid for your life, that is going to stand out to you. Because your spouse is the person who you know better than anyone else. And if you're convinced that they mean to do you harm, that is going to be your focus and your biggest concern. Now, in terms of realism, committing murder is not the most realistic response to being found to have committed a nonviolent white-collar crime. They might go on the run. They might hire a good lawyer and based on their records try to work out some sort of plea agreement. But resorting to murder is not a typical response. And he does not really know these people. Most likely beyond a working relationship. So, in essence, he's more familiar with their workplace persona. And while doing something like embezzlement is out of character for that type of persona they presented, it doesn't logically follow that his life was in peril, particularly when he viewed a far greater danger from his ex-wife. So it really is a matter of perception. And unfortunately for Mr. Martin, he judged risk poorly. But I don't find his judgment to be unbelievable. Emmett asked, uh, was this the last John Lund? And I apologize if I wasn't clear on that. It was the last John Lund episode we have in circulation. Now, there were three other episodes that played after the Sarah Martin matter, and those are not in circulation. Now, if those episodes, or any of the other handful of episodes from the Lund era that are missing, or the O'Brien or Russell era for that matter, we will do what we did when we had Lund and O'Brien episodes come into circulation after we'd finished playing them, and 
play those on a separate day. Though this will be after we finish up all of the Bob Bailey serials, which are going to take around 58 weeks. Finally, we have an email from Derek, which seemed appropriate for our 4,000th episode. He writes, Adam, just found out that you had actually abandoned some podcasts, which led me to Google Adam Graham Dead Podcast, was surprised by some of these results. Adam Graham sings Elvis and Sinatra, Doctor Who, Doctor Tam, and Doctor Pepper. Three, mime time. Adam step by step instruction in the art of miming, a beginner's guide to the surefire no risk investment of Bitcoin, and five Iowa life cornfields and cows. That's a fun list, Derek. Nothing to do with reality as far as this Adam Graham is concerned. A great piece of life advice, folks, if you decide to take up miming, don't get instructions from a podcast by a guy who struggles with understanding hand signals. But in all seriousness, I do have some dead podcasts. Now, it's an interesting topic in the podcasting community where there are lists of how many podcasts there are, which now number in the millions, but most of those are abandoned or dead. Now, certainly, you could count quite a few for me, depending on how you count them. We have a lot of archive feeds that haven't had new episodes posted for months or years. I tend to view those as more complete or finished. Or in the case of something like our specials feed or the rare and forgotten detectives feed, as something where we'll have something added intermittently. I have had a couple of podcasts outside of the realm of old-time radio that have not actually made it. I did a bargain hunting podcast. I did a baseball podcast. And of course, I did the Classy Comics podcast for more than 120 episodes. And there were others. So, I'm not one to judge those who have dead podcasts. Finding something that works, a, a big part of that is also discovering what else might not work and becoming comfortable with that. And I'm okay with having podcasts out there that I haven't worked on in a while. You know, it shows the progress as a person and there's no reason to hide it. Though if I had done the Elvis and Sinatra podcast, I would be honor bound to spend the rest of my days hunting down every downloaded copy in addition to purging it from the internet. Thanks once again for the email, Derek. And now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Sean, Patreon supporter since June of 2021. Currently supporting the program at the Seamus level of $4 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Sean. And that will do it for today. A reminder, you can follow the podcast using your favorite podcast software. And if you are enjoying this podcast on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and mark the notification bell. We'll be back on Friday with another episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. But join us back here tomorrow for Dangerous Assignment, where... Who was it, Steve? Bellboy. Brought her the paper. Could have been some sort of a signal. Hey, wait a minute. She's leaving. What? Yeah, she just went by our room. Probably heading for the stairs. Wait a minute. Let her get down the hall away. Okay, let's go. Yeah, heading down the stairs into the lobby. I got a car outside if we need it, Steve. Good. Hey, uh, maybe we... Hey, watch it, Steve. We better go single file. The stairway's getting crowded. Hey, brother, is that all one man coming up at us? Yeah, how about that? I beg your pardon, gentlemen. Sorry to crowd you. Oh, that's okay. If you'll just allow me to squeeze by. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Squeeze is the word, all right. Yeah, come on. There she is, sitting in that chair on the other side of the lobby. Let's just sit down here. Oh, okay. Uh, and she may contact somebody here in the lobby, Steve. Wait, she's getting up. Yeah. Hey, she dropped something in the far side of her chair. Huh? You see? She's picking it up now. 
Yeah. Looks like a pencil. I wonder what... Oh, she stopped at the cigarette counter. Come on. I want to take a look around that chair where she was sitting. There was no one near her, Steve. I know. Here we are. I still want to know what she was doing with a pencil. She must have been holding it in her right hand. On this side of the chair, out of our sight. I get it now. Look. This pipe running up the wall beside the chair. It goes right through the ceiling. Probably to the second floor hall above us. Yeah. And there are pencil smudges on the pipe near the floor. Yeah, she could have been tapping that pipe with her pencil, sending a message. Steve, she's heading out the door. Stay with her, Kurt. I'm going to see what I can find out upstairs. I head upstairs two at a time. The second floor hall is dark, but I spot the pipe running up the wall, and then I hear a door close at the far end of the hall. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.